I'm joined tonight by futurist and lawyer and contemplative friend of the show, <laughs> Andrew Eborn. <laughs> Andrew, what's your take on well, the climate crisis? I, I think ain't that the truth. I think all the points that you made in your speech are very, very valid. It was Edward Bernays, the father of PR, who said that the best way to sell anything is through fear. And boy, have we been living in a whole era of fear. We live in a diseased information age, don't we? And I think you say the science, put the word the in front of it, and it does, it shuts off the conversation. Your point about weather maps have become scarier and scarier, haven't they? What do you call it? A pizza, right? It is a sort of pizza because on that reality, sort of basis. The numbers haven't changed. Yeah. So all they can do is colour them. Well, the, the trouble as well, though, Ian, is that... Every, I'm sorry, Neil, is that everybody's become an expert. And so what's happened is that in a pandemic, everybody becomes a virologist or we become scientists or constitution, we talk about all that sort of side, and we're drowning in a sea of information, most of which is false. And what we should do is look at the facts, try and get different sources, make sure they're verified, peer verified, and come to an informed decision. And what I love about your show, we've got both sides of the equation today, yeah. haven't we? Yeah, I... I, I am genuinely mystified about the whole uh, net zero, yes. you know, zero carbon, because this is a carbon-based planet, and we and the rest of life, it's carbon-based. So what is actually meant by zero carbon? And it's bizarre, it's, it's marketing speak, isn't it? It's a little mission, it's incredibly expensive, and you have to work out how effective it is. People say that smoking uh, accentuates the risk of lung cancer. Mm. Well, the question is, to what extent has humanity contributed to these changes in temperature? And you're right, you look at history, we've had extremes of temperature, and we have the Cassandra of climate change. There's an article uh, in The Times today with uh, um, the wonderful uh, Lucy Bannerman, and she was talking about Frederica Otto, there she is in all her wonderfulness, and she does these sort of verified sort of tests to say, look, we're 600 times more likely as a result of human contribution to see these in increased temperatures. I'm not a scientist, and, no. I, I, and then I think not most people who comment on these things are not really scientists. What we need to do is get the educated people who understand this space, give them the facts and figures, and then let's try to make a reasoned decision based this, on that. This 97% figure that's bandied about, we need, it's only legitimate to listen to the other scientists, yep. and they are not 3%. That's a bogus figure. Yep. We need to listen to the scientists, the experts who are saying that there's a different correlation and causation and relationship between CO2 and the temperature of the planet and our contribution to all of that. Yeah. And that side of the conversation has been silenced. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. And as soon as you shut down a debate, that's the time to get worried. That's the time to get worried. We're on a break already. Coming up after the break, I'll be joined by the researcher, commentator and blogger Ben Pyle to ask whether the high temperatures in the Mediterranean at the moment are the result of global warming. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Thanks for hanging on in there with Neil Oliver Live. Now, among much else we're discouraged from questioning is the notion that nothing poses more of a threat to life on Earth than you, me, and the rest of the human race. Our dependence on oil and gas, we're told, will soon make life unlivable for all. Speaking only for myself, I'm not convinced, not by a long chalk, and it's a subject I'm keen to hear talked about properly. Joining me first of all this evening is researcher, commentator, and blogger Ben Pyle to contemplate how worried we should be about the weather reports from the Med. Good evening, Ben. Thanks for joining me. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having me, um, yeah, um, yeah, It's good to be here and meet at last. What do you make of these reddened, blackened, purple weather maps that were being shown about popular holiday des destinations? Well, I think you and Andrew put your finger on it a moment ago. This is marketing, changing the colours and hoping that people are going to buy this more attractive product or this more scary product. Um, because now it's got these sort of uh, science fiction um, picture uh, representations of heat, these purples, these blacks, these very, very sort of alarming colours. And this is this is um, this has been tried many times um, in different forms. We've even had um, uh, well, climate marketeers, I suppose you could call them. And people, in fact, very much associated with the ninety-seven percent survey that you cited earlier, they were trying to explain um, or, or explain the heat in the atmosphere that had been accumulated, as, as they claim, as a result of uh, global warming, in terms of uh, nuclear bombs. <clears throat> 
So how many more, how many nuclear bombs of energy um, there are in the atmosphere? And, and, and similarly, um, a, a different group of, of climate activists and climate marketeers have tried to explain the uh, accumulation of heat in the oceans um, not in terms of degrees centigrade or Fahrenheit, as most people, including scientists, would have understood, but in terms of the joules or megajoules or in, in, in a astronomical numbers, you know, numbers that would take 20, you know, 24 uh, places to, to, to represent. And these are all just different ways to try and, 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 and make you more scared so that they feel more confident in, in having conveyed their emotions to you. But bear with me. And what we should bear, really do about it. Bear with me, Ben. Ben. Bear with me, Ben. Andrew Ebon, how do you react to that? You know, this idea that we're being, you know, it, it feels again like we're being nudged. Yes. Nudged to think something that's in somebody else's interest that's not necessarily I, I, the case. With all these things, you have to ask why we're being told it, who's telling us, and what benefits do they have as a result of doing it? It was Abraham Lincoln who said, if you say, basically, a calf, if you count the tail, how many legs does a calf have? Um, the answer is still four, it's not five, if you count the, the, the tail as a leg. Uh, tell a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. What we need to find out, and this is why I say get the scientists together, to what extent is any of this man-made because it's not there's certainly other causes and we look at throughout history and those sort of causes and maybe i can ask ben exactly that question do you think man has contributed at all to this side there you go ben what do you say well um probably um that that seems to be there's good scientific argu uh, uh, arguments and good scientific evidence that CO2 is a greenhouse gas and that this will warm the atmosphere and that that warmer atmosphere may may produce somewhat different climate. What I disagree with, what I think is important, is how that climate change or how that global warming turns into uh, the climate crisis, as we've been told, we've been um, warned is happening and, and is going to um, get worse. Because there's no evidence of that. There might be evidence of a slightly warmer atmosphere, and I stress it's slightly warmer. And there might be there might be slightly different um, climate patterns. But we're not seeing a massive, as as um, as uh, Neil's monologue really well demonstrated. We're not seeing um, a, a, a huge increase of uh, catastrophic events of extreme weather. And in fact, what we do see is a massively reduced impact of weather of all kinds, including extreme weather, on, uh, on us. So climate impacts over the last century have diminished completely. So, so in, in, in the heat wave, for example, in London in 1911, there were more than a thousand deaths, uh, mostly as a, as a consequence, in fact, of spoiled food, um, which children ate, and then they sad, sadly died of diarrhea because of the food poisoning. Um, so so climate, climate interacts with the way we live our lives in very many different ways, and refrigeration um, was an innovation that, that, that dramatically changed that. So, so um, we, we, we were much better able to survive heat waves by um, storing food better or chilling the air um, for, for more vulnerable people. Heat waves really it did does, used to be a problem. Does, so so, sound, so I'm sound, not... It does sound to me though, as though, Ben, we would be relinquishing what control we have over our own well-being by surrendering fossil fuels at this moment. But, Ben, I've run out of time. Thank you so much for your contribution so far this evening, and it's a conversation I'd like to pick up with you again in the weeks and months ahead. Another break is here. Coming up afterwards, we'll be joined by environmental campaigner Donaghy McCarthy, who says, on the contrary, the world is on fire and we should really be incredibly concerned about climate change. All of that coming up. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Few subjects inflame emotions like climate change. Battle lines are drawn and neither side seems willing to give an inch. Joining me now to contemplate how close we are to the end of life on Earth is environmental campaigner Donica McCarthy. Uh, Donica, thank you for joining us. Andrew, how do you, how do you react? Well, I'm, I'm sure, I, what I love about this debate, what I love about this debate is we're going to shine more light, less heat. It was interesting talking to Ben earlier and I asked him the question, to what extent has humanity contributed? Because that's the question, isn't it? He did agree that there has been some sort of contribution. The question is quantum. So when you quote about 800,000 years, I would first of all say, how do we know that? Because I'm not a scientist, as we may admit at the very beginning. What we need to do is work out, where's the common ground? Well, that's very easy. The, the science 
science, if you want to know where the science yes, came from, is actually scientists went to the, to the Arctic, okay. which were the, the thousands and thousands of years of ice records, and you drill down two miles, right. and you pull it up, and you look at the amount of CO2 okay. at every metre. And that's how they're able to tell the history of CO2 on this planet. So, what do, you so say, what do you say to people who say, look, hang about, throughout history, the planet's been warmed and so on and so forth, with Neil in his monologue at the beginning. What do you say to them? It's true. The planet has heated and got cooled. Well, what we haven't done is, is we've actually, as humans, thrown the equivalent of a million years right. of stored carbon every year into the atmosphere. So we are very, very fast changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere. And the chemical, atmosphere of the, uh, the chemical composition of the atmosphere has always changed. But the, co the consequences are terrifying. They happen over millions of years. Yes. What we are doing is over decades. So, so your common ground is that humanity has contributed is the disagreement as to the quantum of that contribution? The disagreement is, is actually um, is, is whether or not we take action. OK. And I would argue that's the problem. There is, you, you talked about in, in your intro about you know, the debate being shut down. I experience it quite differently. I look at the British media and I see the Telegraph, the Mail, the Sun, the Express, GB News and Talk TV, almost all fighting climate action. And I feel very, very despairing because actually I think the future of this country is at stake. I look at the science and the science predicted that if you add carbon, it gets hotter. And if you, it gets hotter, we does get it, consequences does such it as... Though, does it though? I mean, 150 million years ago, you know, the, 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 the temperature fell dramatically on the planet at the same time that levels of CO2 spiked dramatically. You know, and so and, at the, and during the Eocene thermal maximum, right, when the temperature was higher than any time in the last half a billion years, the CO2 had been on a downward track at that point for 150 million years. So rising, the, the planet getting warmer and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere doesn't correlate in the way that you're saying that it necessarily well, does. There, there are other, there are many, many impacts on the temperature and on climate. What is irrefutable is basic physics. Is that if you, if you actually measure the amount of heat coming through a gas, the carbon dioxide traps it. Now then the argument is, should we actually stop burning fossil fuels? In my view, should we take that gamble with future generations? The, the science will say there's a 1% chance. It will always say there's a 1% chance, 5% chance that the settled science is wrong. Always does that. But would you get on a plane that has a 95% chance of crashing. Oh, it's an interesting point. And, and what, what I love about this is that you talk about not having the discussion, the discussion is taking place. A lot of the people go too far. People like Just Stop Oil actually alienate a lot of people as a result of the actions they take. Whereas if you have a, a sensible discussion about it and say, look, these are the steps you need to take to make that make sense. What steps should we take and what difference will it actually make? Well, this, this, what Just Stop Oil has a very simple demand which says stop investing in new fossil fuels to add to the problem and invest instead in energy efficiency, in renewables and storage. I mean, I think you're a futurist. Yes, absolutely. Um, I predicted 25 years ago when I installed the first solar panels in London into my house that in 20, 30 years, the role of an energy company would be to manage energy, not produce it. So I've got to a stage where my bills for my house are minus £100 a year. Very good. I don't have a gas bill. My water bill is £100 and my, my electricity bill is minus 250 So uh, for most of the year, I've imported nothing, morning, noon and night, because I've got batteries and solar panels. Is that not something we would want for, oh, no, so for working-class people? Ad, absolutely. Very good from an economic point of view. And you should have, uh, basically, you should make sure you insulate, because that will sure. work on that sort of basis as well. Before, we go, before I'll, I'll, I'll lose you because of time, what about mm. the argument that, uh, you know, uh, James Lovelock, he of the Gaia, argument yeah. you know he has recanted to some extent and now speculates or at least allows for the possibility that we might be the saviors of the planet by releasing more co2 that we that that what we what we are actually what we should be doing is actually increasing actively the amount of co2 in the atmosphere <laughs> because of the greening that it would enable gaia or the planet to perform. Uh, I don't and know. That would be a more robust, more fertile planet would be good for all of us. Uh, I don't know where you got that from, James Lovelock. James Lovelock, bless him, has died. 
um, he, he's departed. But um, the quote, I actually read a quote today from James Lum, and it was actually the other extreme that he was saying, that in his view that we, we are potentially past the safe zone, that we are inverse. And so, so, therefore so, therefore we're, we're, so therefore so we're, we are on, on that balance whether or not we have a chance of surviving. Now, if, the 90, if I'm correct that 95% of, of science saying that I am correct is true, Surely the patriotic thing to do is to take action and actually invest in a renewable, low-energy economy that actually people can have warm homes and low bills and we save have the planet. Leave, have to leave that conversation there simply because we've run out of time, but thank you for that, Donna McCarthy. We're on another break, unfortunately, after which it's fossil hunters and a 450,000-year-old mammoth tusk in Cambridgeshire. Stay with us. There you are, thanks for staying with me. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. Fossil hunters made a mammoth discovery in Cambridgeshire last week, unearthing an enormous 450,000 year old tusk. It was in a gravel quarry, uh, whence many of these discoveries come as it turns out. And a pair of history lovers came across the remains of an ancient giant just under the surface of the sand, a well-preserved relic four feet in length that may have belonged to a steppe mammoth during the Ice Age or some part thereof. I'm joined now by Jamie Jordan and Sarah Moore, uh, the founders and curators of Fossils Galore. Hello both, I love a story like this. Where's the rest of the mammoth? I know, yeah. <laughs> tell me, oh what an image that is, but tell me how it feels to you to be in the presence, the physical presence of something that is, you know, 450,000 <laughs> years old. It's brilliant. <laughs> So they're, uh, they're quite a marvel to see. I mean, when you look at uh, pictures, we, as you can see, we use our dog as a, a size image, but it's actually quite big. And uh, the customers we've had come in and actually see it in our preparation laboratory, they've all said the same thing. Um, it's, a, it's a lot bigger in person than they thought it was going to be. Yeah. Andrew, Andrew Eborn is with me in the studio. Um, Andrew, how do you react? Do you know I, I, like, is, is that, I have to ask, is that crystal? Is that, that's your special beagle? That is, yes, that's Crystal. The uh, because Crystal me. normally goes on the hunt with you to find these fossils. What I love about it is it what it reveals about life at that particular time, because as I understand it, bears and lions and also hippos used to wander around our, our part of sort of Cambridgeshire at that time. Isn't that right? That's, that's correct, yeah. It was, it was, it was a very uh, interesting environment at the time um, with, with big animals roaming about. Um, so completely different to what you see today. Yeah, I also understand that the tusks of the mammoth, you, rather like a tree, you can tell about the environment. And if the particular rings are very tightly done, they've got a bad habitat, but if they're nice and thick, the rings, uh, then they were living very well. So I'm an expert on these things. They were. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Um, and you can also, uh, something that I'm very interested in as well, you can actually see how the mammoth lived um, through marks on the outside of the tusk. So whether it was preyed upon or not. Was it, and was it living well? You know, was this a healthy, happy mammoth? <laughs> Uh, so far from what we can see, it's, it's really hard to see at the moment, but um, we've, we've seen that there's, there's quite thick rings in there between uh, the middle of its life as such. Um, but it's, it's something that we, we, we're looking to research a bit more as, as we go in uh, after the preservation has uh, finished. Is it valuable? I mean, you know, obviously it's, it's ivory. Is it, 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 hypothetically, is, does, is it valuable? In fact, I'm going to have to cut you there. I'm going to have to wait for that answer because I'm running out of time. Thank you both. Thank you for being with me this evening. We'll be back at the same time next week. And up next is the wonderful and incomparable Father Calvin Robinson and his common sense crusade. <laughs>